30 of the handout if you have the handout. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So this is an everlasting covenant. It's, it, it's in force today and will be in force tomorrow. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So God says, I'm giving this land, this is a real estate deal. God is giving the land to the, uh, it turns out to be the Jews, but here he's just saying Abraham's seed. And it's going to be an everlasting possession. <laughs> Doesn't belong to the Abrahams or anybody else. It belongs to the seed of Abraham, although the Arabs are the seed of Abraham. But we're going to narrow that down. Verse, uh, that, uh, and I will be their God. The Arabs do not have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's not their God, although they claim it is. Allah, or Allah, is not the same. God that uh, the God of the Bible is. Elohim. That's right. <clears throat> the Lord God. Jehovah. They're not the same. One is a moon God. Allah is a moon God. Yep. <clears throat> and he was adopted by uh, Muhammad a long, you know, long time ago. 7th, 8th century. Somewhere along in there. When we went through the uh, religion of Islam, we saw all that. So they're not the same God. They're not the same religion. They don't, don't have the land. That's not their land. God now appeared to Abram and spoke to him. This time God came down in person to speak and to walk with Abram. God did, did this also with Enoch and Noah. Probably Adam and Eve. Two before the fall. Now look in verse 22 of Genesis 17. <clears throat> <clears throat> this is a continuous dialogue here. <clears throat> it says, The Lord appeared to Abram in verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abram in verse 1. Then look at verse 22. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. So he came down and talked to Abraham. At this time, Abram is 99 years of age, which means we can positively and definitely set the date of this momentous occasion. Since Abram was born in 1995 B.C., and we were told that he was 99 years of age, the date must be 1896 B.C. That's when this happened. This puts your Bible apart from all other ancient literature. The Quran can't give you exact dates. None of the Buddhist literature can give you the exact dates. Hindu literature, none of them can. But your Bible, the first time you run into any kind of dates from ancient literature is way after the Greeks come along. And they started uh, doing some dates based on the king's reign. 
And later on, when the Bible got complete, some of the popes began to make calendars, but it was all based on the Bible. And then uh, they, uh, uh, they even changed the calendar when they found out they had it wrong. You had the uh, Gregorian calendar and the, uh, what am I thinking of? I can't, there's two calendars anyway. One I of them. Forgot the other one. Yeah, but, uh, <clears throat> but they're just Bible, is all it is. And we can start uh, with uh, the birth of Christ, and you can go backwards, and the Bible will, as, as you can figure out all the dates from the Bible, beginning with the birth of Christ. If you start with the birth of Christ and, and, and make it zero B, B.C., you know, zero B.C. A.D., start going backwards. <clears throat> and then the book of Daniel tells you about the 70 weeks. And uh, it just, it, and then you have the reigns of the kings. He reigned in this, he reigned for so many years and died and all that. And it goes all the way back. And in Genesis, it tells how old everybody was. Anyway, a fellow by the name of Bishop Usher, he he's got a chronology of all that. He just took it straight from the Bible. And so you have a very unique book in your hands. It's the most reliable, ancient, historical literature in existence. And it can give you exact dates. So this happened, 1896 B.C., it has been 14 years since God last appeared and spoke with Abram. He and Sarai's great sin in the matter of Hagar has caused a 14-year gap in fellowship with God. Notice 16, <coughs> verse 16. And Abram was fourscore and six year old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. So, uh, there's all kinds of different ways you can you can do this. Uh, what, see Genesis sixteen sixteen, where Abram was eighty six years old when Ishmael was born, and therefore eighty five when God last spoke with him. He, he spoke with him, and then they try to take matters into their own hand. <coughs> Now let's look at God's part of the covenant. God identified himself as the Almighty God. Uh, El Shaddai means God Almighty. This is the first time God has identified himself as such. This name describes his omnipotence. God is trying to convince Abram that he can and will perform all that he promised. If our God is Almighty, then he can do anything he pleases. Now that's limited by his holiness. His holiness actually limits it. You know, God cannot lie, for example. Then God even changes Abram's name to page 31. Y'all have 31 out of Yes. Abraham to further convince him that he will perform his promise to greatly multiply Abram's offspring. Abram means exalted father but Abraham means father of a multitude. A.B. in front of a uh, Hebrew word in the Old Testament means father. <clears throat> the covenant was established between God and Abram and his seed after him. God has a part to fulfill and Abram and his seed has a part to fulfill. God's part is to make the Jews exceedingly fruitful and multiply them and give them the land from the Nile River to the Euphrates River for an everlasting possession. That's God's part. Now let's look at Abraham's and his seed's part of the covenant. Beginning in verse number 9. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. Okay, God, what are we supposed to do? This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. That's the Jews' part.
Ark of the Covenant. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house are bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child, <clears throat> whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. Why is that? Because he hath broken my covenant. That didn't say because there, but he's broken the covenant. So, that's the Jews' part of that. Now, that's a good deal, buddy. You circumcise all the male children, and then you get all this land, I'll multiply you. I mean, uh, that is a great a great covenant. And Abraham believed God and counted it to him for righteousness. This covenant is binding on Abraham's children through Isaac and Jacob. They must keep it. They are to circumcise all the male children on the eighth day after birth. Circumcision is a sign or token of the covenant. Circumcision extends to all male members of the household, not just lineal descendants of Abraham. This would include all male non-Jewish servants, slaves, and strangers born in the household or acquired with money. The Abrahamic covenant is everlasting. Both on God's part and Abraham's part, and so also for the Jewish race. Non-compliance with circumcision means that individual has broken the covenant and will be cut off. That is killed or separated from the Jews in God's promised land. So, of course, a baby can't understand that. But when you get older... And you begin to understand God's promises, you're going to, if you don't get circumcised, you've broken that covenant with God. Now, let's look at the fact that the covenant applies to the offspring of Sarah only. <clears throat> Verse 15, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of many nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Now God's already seen that Abraham don't believe it. How old is Abraham at this time? He's 99 years old. And and Sarah is old too. So look what Abraham does in verse 17. Then Abram fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And that's what he's thinking, and he's laughing about it. And Abram said unto God, All oh, that Ishmael might live before thee! Exclamation. And God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him. What about Ishmael? Didn't say anything about Ishmael. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Not Ishmael or not Ishmael's seed. It didn't say that. As And as far as Ishmael, I've heard thee. Behold, I blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall, be, shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. Verse 21. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, 
which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with Abram. No, he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. <clears throat> so this leaves out the Arab. <laughs> now, it is true, uh, I believe the pastor brought this up last week. It is true that uh, you have uh, uh, Isaac's brother, uh, Esau. He began, he got mingled in with them a little bit. But the Edomites got wiped out, and the Philistines have been wiped out. All you have left over there is uh, mingled people. The Bible calls them mingled people, the Arabs. <coughs> uh, but uh, until the Lord restored the Jews, I believe he did restore them in 1948 over there. They made it. But this is not the final biblical restoration that God has promised because they're going to get all that land all the way to Euphrates River. <clears throat> God changed Sarai's name to Sarah from my princess to princess. Sarai means my princess. The I on the end of a Hebrew word means I. <clears throat> uh, I can't, right now I can't think of any uh, example. I meant my princess. Her daddy or mama married her, uh, named her my princess. And now uh, God changed it to Sarah, meaning princess. Then God explained to Abraham that he would bless Sarah and give him a son through her. God repeated the promise of a greatly multiplied descendants, but through Sarah. Abraham still lacked enough faith to believe God fully. So he laughed in his heart. Now, Ishmael didn't come through Sarah. Is that right? Ishmael come through Hagar. So Ishmael was cut out of it. But because of the failing, because Ishmael is innocent in all this, because Hagar is innocent in all this, God, in his compassion, loving compassion, says, I'm going to make 12 princes out of him. He's not part of my promise. He laughed in his heart <coughs> and appeared, that's supposed to be it appears, not I appear, that God rebuked Abraham for doubting when he said, and God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Since God promised to establish his covenant with Isaac, Ishmael and all his descendants are eliminated from the covenant. No Arab has any part in the land of promise. <clears throat> Excuse me, that was just a second. Uh, Isaac means laughter or to laugh. I believe God made a statement to Abraham by naming his son Laughter. That's supposed to be by naming his son S-O-N. Boy, no matter how many times I go over this, I'll, I'll, I'll make top of it, top of it. And he's making a statement that he knew that Abraham laughed in his heart. So he said, you're name, going to name him Laughter. Abraham tried to hide his feelings from God by saying, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. God repeated his promise that he made to Hagar that he would bless and multiply the seed of Ishmael. But, notice the little conjunction, but, in verse 21. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, not Ishmael. <clears throat> the Abrahamic covenant is binding through Sarah's child. Isaac, not Ishmael. <clears throat> the next year would be 1895 B.C., which would be the birth year of Isaac. Then the Bible tells us that God ended his conversation and went up from him. I went to the eye doctor. <clears throat> She got me some drops. I've been putting them in my eyes. Boy, they work so good.
good. All of a sudden today, I can, my eyes running like a faucet. All right. Verse 23. And Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the self same day as God had said unto him. Now, buddy, that's good, isn't it? I mean, God tells him to do something, and that day he did it. Uh, uh, if you study the life of Abraham, you may find, uh, you know, where he had a lapse, him and Sarah had a lapse one or two times. But overall, Abraham was a very good and great man. Yeah. He believed God. That God was going to do these things. And God counted him for righteousness. And then he, he said, we're going to circumcise everybody in this household today. <laughs> and Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And the self same day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael, his son, and all the men of his house, born in the house and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. So you had a uh, slave. I, this is not a lesson on slavery, but slavery has been a part of the human race for 6,000 years. I mean, it's just people, uh, I, don't, I don't like slavery. <coughs> uh, but this is a historical fact. Abraham had slaves. He fought for them. That's no justification for slavery. Yeah. Some people trying to justify slavery had used the fact that Abraham had slaves, bought and paid for them. That's no justification. Just because some sinner on the earth does something doesn't mean it's okay to do it. I don't care who he is. <clears throat> so, uh, but everybody had to, had to be circumcised. It is refreshing to see that Abraham obeyed God the same day God instituted circumcision as a token of the Abrahamic covenant. Any questions or comments? Now some of the Reformed theologians want to make baptism sprinkling. Uh, the New Testament equivalent of circumcision uh, we have the church has taken the place of the Jews. The Jews rejected Christ, and so God's rejected them. And this is the, what they're saying. <clears throat> and now the church has taken the place. We get all the promises that God promised the Jew, and a token of that promise, that covenant, is baptism. That's how they define baptism. And of course, they, they can be sprinkled or poured or anything. You know. <clears throat> so they try to make that. Well, that's a tremendously gross uh, interpretation of Scripture. It's just, it's just it's ridiculous. Because baptism has nothing to do with that. It's a, it's a church ordinance, a local church ordinance. We have two of them, as the pastor explained a few Sundays ago. We have the Lord's Supper. It shows the death of the Lord till he come. And we have baptism, which shows the burial and resurrection of the Lord. So uh, that's, what, that's what that's all about. It's church ordinances. It has nothing to do with us replacing the Jews. I mean, you're making it out to God to be a liar. <laughs> God said, this is everlasting covenant. And then somewhere along the line, 2,000 years later, God said, well, I didn't mean that. You know, if God can abrogate his promise to the Jews, he can do it to us. 
which means he's not a holy God. If he's not a holy God, buddy, we're in big trouble. We're at the mercy of the whims of a God, an all-powerful being. But thank God, he is a merciful God. He's a holy God. He's an unchangeable God. And when he makes an everlasting covenant, buddy, he keeps it. And so the church is totally different. We have not taken the place of the Jews. That's called replacement theology. We don't. That's ridiculous. It's against the Bible. All right, let's look in chapter 18, unless you have a question or comment today. We have Abraham entertaining angels. Now, we've had... Uh, Angel, angels are in the Bible. Angels are really exist, and they do have interaction with humans down here in this earth. A good book to read on that is The Spirit World by Clarence Larkin. He's got a little book called The Spirit World. <clears throat> All right, verse 1 of chapter 18. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. So the Lord appeared. This is Jehovah God. This is an appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. And, so, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. So Abraham now... He recognizes these people. So God has already appeared to him back in 17. The visiting men are obviously two angels, and the Lord Jehovah God came down and visited with his friend Abraham. Angels are men and not females. They do not have wings. The heat of the day is mid-afternoon. Many cultures enjoy a time of rest and refreshment during this time. The fact that Abraham ran and met them, then bowed, shows that he recognized these men as angels. He called one Adonai, which is one of the names of God, and means Lord of men and of earth. It is often used with God as in the Lord God. In the narrative, Moses, who wrote this? He wrote this. Moses wrote this. In the narrative, Moses calls the same person Jehovah. Jehovah in the AB 1611 is designated by the word Lord written with all capital letters. See, in verse 1 there, and the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre. That's Abraham. That's uh, <coughs> Moses. Writing this, and later on we find out that God, uh, that He hadn't been known as Jehovah. He says up to this time I hadn't been known as Jehovah. And then you find the word Jehovah written here, and all the Bible critics jump up and down, and clap their hands, and say, "Here's a mistake in the Bible. A mistake in the Bible." Oh, they're so happy they found a mistake in the Bible. Uh, not so fast. This was written after Jehovah had been revealed. Moses wrote this. And this is a narrative that Moses is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So it's not a mistake after all, so calm yourself down. <clears throat> now, I want us to look at James 2.23. Is that, is that clear what I just said? 
See, Moses didn't write this until about 1400 B.C., maybe 1450 B.C. He's writing this way after God had revealed himself as Jehovah. Or James 2.23. his friend Abraham. This is showing that Abraham and God were friends. They come and visit him at his tent door. And he went and prepared a meal for him. When somebody comes to your house, what do you do? Don't you get some iced tea for them or something? Lemonade? Uh, get them a cup of coffee, maybe some cookies or something, and sit down? And the scripture was fulfilled which said Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called a friend of God. Or Isaiah 41, 8. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. <laughs> Abraham called a friend to God. And we're going to see that more and more, more, more in there. <clears throat> Exodus 33, 11. Exodus 33, 11. Exodus 33, 11, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Well, that's what God did with Abraham. He spoke with him face to face. <clears throat> All right. Uh, angels are men and not females, Genesis 19, 1. Now, now, this is, uh, we're going to go over this quick because I'm not reading you anything you don't already know. Genesis 19, 1. And there came two angels to Sodom and Eden. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Then look, verse 10. But the men, talk about the same people, Put forth their hand and pull Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. And then look in verse 12. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. And in verse 16. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. The Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. I believe there's probably a time in Lot's life he probably wished that the angel just left him there. What a sad ending to Lot. Poor, broken-hearted man. But anyway, I just want to show you about the men being <clears throat> now the fact that Abraham ran and met them then bowed shows that he recognized these men as angels <clears throat> he called one Adonai which is one of the names of God it means Lord of men and earth it is often used with God as in the Lord God and we've read this in the narrative Moses calls the same person Jehovah Jehovah in the AB 1611 is designated by the word Lord written in all capital letters. So far, God has revealed himself with names. 
Elohim, translated as God, and means the Creator God. El Shaddai, translated as God Almighty, and speaks of God's omnipotence. Adonai, translated as Lord, see the capital L, but the little O-R-D, lowercase, with first letter capitalized, and means Lord of men and earth. Moses had been using Jehovah in writing Genesis, but the name has not been revealed as to its meaning. <clears throat> Jehovah means I am the self-existing one. And that, uh, so Genesis 2, 4, and 5. You see Genesis 2, 4, and 5. These are the generations of the heaven and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord, cap, all caps, Lord God made the earth and the heaven. That's Jehovah God. But God hadn't revealed himself as that at this time. But Moses, who is writing it, it had been revealed to him. So he's just writing out this narrative under the inspiration of God. <clears throat> now, Jehovah means I am, which is the self-existing one. I am. No matter what time in history you find God, it's always I am. It's never I was or I will be. It's always present. I am. He's the self-existing one. He's always in the present tense. You go back 10 million years, you find God as I am. You go forward 10 million years, and God's still I am. And when, Je when they uh, found Jesus in the garden, they said, Who are, are you, Jesus? He said, I am. <laughs> and they all fell down Jesus. backwards. Right. If uh, <laughs> I was in that crowd and I heard him say, I am, that knocked me down. No, I believe I would have thought, wait a minute here. Amen. There's something special about this man. Amen. I am. Wait a minute. That's a Jehovah God in the Old Testament. <clears throat> and uh, it, Jesus equated himself with, with the great I am. And we sing a song about that, of course. He's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I, you know. So, uh, one time I, I enjoy a uh, series sermon series. I like to have a series of sermons. Maybe three or four. <clears throat> I saw Jesus say, I am. And they said, he said before Abraham was, I am. Now, normally we would say before Abraham was, I was. But he said, I am. And boy, they picked up stones to stone him. So I thought, I wonder how many times Jesus identified himself as I am. And I found 14. I am Alpha and Omega. Remember that? I am the offspring of, root and offspring of David. <clears throat> I am the vine. I am the door. So I've uh, got a series of uh, seven in that series on the I Am's of Christ. And I was surprised to discover that it begins in the Old Testament in the book of uh, Esther. He talks about being the bright morning star. You know, I am, uh, what does he say? Not Esther. Uh, The, other, the book of uh, Song of Solomon. Let's turn to the book of Song of Solomon right here. Yeah. 
first time Jesus refers to himself as I am something. So uh, it means that he's a self-existing one. Chapter 2, verse 1, says, I am the rose of Sharon. That's it. That's it. Thank you. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord is just as prominent in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament, isn't he? And I often bring out this illustration. When I was an unsaved man, I was really, really interested in science fiction. And there's a guy named Isaac Asimov who wrote a famous book, novel called I, Robot. <clears throat> I was in a bookstore one time and I saw where he wrote a commentary of the Bible. I thought, wow, i got to read that. You know, I wasn't saved. <laughs> I got that book. I didn't read it. But then I got saved and I thought, hmm, I wonder what he said. And in the introduction he says, it is surprising that Jesus Christ is not mentioned at all in the Old Testament. <laughs> really? Are you blind? <laughs> He's all through the Old Testament. And, uh, and, and in the New Testament too. Alright. Uh, next week we'll start with Genesis 18.4. Uh, it's interesting to see that Abraham uh, entertained these angels with food and drink. You mean angels can partake of food and drink? Did Jesus eat a piece of fish? Anything? When after his resurrection? Just check. <clears throat> when you get to heaven, there's a tree up there. The bears a twelve mile tree. You don't get to eat any of it. That's going to be interesting. Every month, a different fruit. Any questions or comments? Okay. Let's stand and we'll be this.